what the data suggests to us is the number one factor kind of accounting for this decline in happiness in America is that fewer Americans are getting married. So this retreat from marriage we're talking about today doesn't just matter again for individuals, it matters kind of for the collective mood of the country as well. And welcome back to the narrative. Uh, this is actually a throwback narrative episode back when the, the good old days when it was just David and I running the show around here uh, before uh, Mike Andrews came on and stole the, the microphone, and st- stole some of our, our time away from us, right? Uh, but Mike Andrews has gone uh, on uh, vacation this week, and uh, just so David and I are are flying at least here for, for segment one. Mike will be back on segment two for our interview with uh, Brad Wilcox. Miss you, Mike. Uh, uh, Not really. That maybe is, I was going to say, okay. okay, that one, right? Okay. But we're, 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 uh, we're, we're looking forward to the conversation that you're going to hear uh, later in the program with, uh, with Brad Wilcox. Brad's a uh, longtime friend and is uh, maybe the, the, the leading scholar in the nation uh, on um, really the importance of marriage uh, to the well-being of children. Um, and, and honestly, it, I really feel like what Brad has researched through the years um, is, is really the linchpin of what so much uh, of going, what's going on in, in our culture and our country uh, is, is hinged on, and that's the breakdown of family, right, and the breakdown of marriage. Uh, and so that, that he just came out with a new book called Get Married, um, and, and it can't recommend it uh, highly enough to you, but also really the discussion we're going to have with Brad, uh, I think you'll enjoy. Uh, but David, jumping in on, on some of the, the news of the week, the news of the things going on, you know, there's really uh, the, the biggest news, and, and we might even try to, to uh, unpack this a little bit more in episodes to come, um, is this news uh, about the, the leaked WPATH mm-hmm. files. Uh, and, and David, you, you have been, uh, as much as anybody in the country at this point, um, sparring to some degree with WPATH and and their uh, you know their their so called research, uh, but just for folks who might not know who WPATH is, we want to unpack a little bit about who they yeah, are. WPATH is the World Professional Association of um, Trans Health, and so basically it's a small subset of of the American Medical Association that establishes uh, regulations around um, gender dysphoria and things of that nature, all of the language that we're going to use, how we code for it. Um, And so um, we actually have a member here in the state of Ohio that's kind of spoken on on a lot of this stuff, and they, they just put out some uh, some regulations that, that, that really just kind of fit right in with what they want, you know, the world to look like as it pertains to people with gender dysphoria. And so, um, just recently we had, um, some more whistleblowers come out. Uh, we've had whistleblowers here in the States and Texas and St. Louis, and, you know, we've worked with some here in Ohio and then, and then the Finnish doctor, um, you know, Dr. Catalia, who really started the first gender clinic in, uh, in Finland. Um, you know, she she's basically came out saying this is harming children. Not only is yeah. it not effective, it's just harming kids. But this recent group are, are actual emails captured from WPATH professionals um, who basically admit to several things. You know, one that that some of these hormones are leading to cancers. Right. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Of, of multiple forms. Uh, and then and, you know, some are saying that uh, you know we've we've overlooked uh, the the parental consent side, and we've overlooked. Um, different um, illnesses, comorbidities that kids are dealing with, you know, just to shove them right down this this road of gender transition. Yeah, and, and I think what's what's important about WPATH is this, this is one of those, and what's so important about these files that were just released is that WPATH is one of those organizations uh, that not a lot of folks have heard of, but that wields uh, immense power and influence uh, both with medical professionals and lawmakers, right? This is something that the left has done really well over the last several decades is they stand up these associations, they stand up these very impressive sounding and intimidating groups with names like the World Professional Association of Transgender Health. Sounds legit. Sounds legit. And, it, and you know, it's really just a group of ideological doctors uh, that have uh, decided to come out and say, look, we're going to come up with our own standards uh, and our, our own practice and then say, this is how this industry should be done. And the left uses these groups as the, the, the bludgeon. Honestly, you know, when, when Governor DeWine was uh, vetoing House Bill 68, the bill to ban trans medicine on kids, um, a lot of the things that was be, being presented to him on why he should veto it, 
came from WPATH. Yeah. Right? And and this is, and we saw this, I mean, you ran into these guys a lot during uh, hearings and testimonies, right? Yeah, and what they do is they conflate standards of care with guidelines, right? And so standards of care is what basically, you know, the consensus of the medical community across the world on, on a particular treatment. Um, and, and what they're really doing is saying, no, these are guidelines. This is what we would suggest you do based on, you know, what, what they're saying works. Um, when as recently as uh, this month, um, we, we just had a report come out from the, Br- the British Journal of Medicine um, basically saying, I, I just want to quote for them, uh, trans youth are not more at risk due to transphobia or invalidation, but due to the well-documented fact that gender dysphoria tends to occur in people who are disturbed and unhappy more generally. These are people who are already struggling. They're really just being taken advantage of. Yeah, and so what you just had happen here uh, this week and from my understanding from, from different friends uh, involved in this is that this is only the beginning yeah. of some of the leaked files that are still going to be coming out about WPATH. Um, but, you know, the w- what you had is Michael Schellenberger, who some, some people might remember uh, from the Twitter files uh, released. He, this was when Elon Musk purchased uh, Twitter and released all of the files showing uh, the FBI and the Biden administration and the Biden campaign and even the Clinton campaign coordinating with Twitter to, to suppress, uh, you know, content on Twitter, things like that. Michael Schellenberger just got a, had a whistleblower come to him with all of these files from WPATH of the doctors uh, that comprise WPATH, basically admitting to all of the things that we said about transgender medicine during the process. You, you mentioned, David, um, you know, and honestly, some of the stuff that we really didn't even get into a ton of during the process, which was, uh, the, maybe the thing that jumped out to me here was how much they talked about cancer, yeah. right? Which, again, just makes sense when you're injecting your body with high doses of uh, a cross-sex hormone, cancer developing, see, like you don't need to be a doctor to be like, that, that seems like something that's going to happen, right? That was right. one of the things that came out. Yeah, one, one of the quotes said, I have one transition friend, colleague, who after about eight to 10 years of testosterone developed uh, liver cancer, right? And then he said that, to the best of my knowledge, uh, it was linked to hormone treatment. Um, just, it was packed with just information like this. And, and then, you know, one of the things they said, Aaron, um, was related um, back to the fact, um, and, and when they testified here uh, with the SAFE Act, there was testimony given, um, written testimony given to where the hospital association said that there was like a hundred clients or a hundred percent of the clients that came to the clinic were were accepted into the yep. program. This one particular doctor um, whistleblower um, on file was basically saying, yeah, t- regrettably, there was only one client that he d- had to turn down um, from acceptance into the clinic. And that was just because they were exhibiting hysteria actually in his uh, office. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's insane what's going on. Well, but- and that, that, David, real quick gets to, I thought, one of the other big things that came out here is the way, th- how, how flippantly these doctors acknowledged that what they were doing it was impossible to get informed consent, but they were doing it anyway. Yeah, right. That that with 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 these people, they they you know. And again, this is one of these things like, and this is just a general rule. This will be one of my takeaways from this. If something seems so obviously wrong, the, mo, you know, the, the, this is you know the most simple answer is probably the truth that it is wrong. Yeah. Right. So like, it seems so obviously wrong to lock children into a, a sterilizing and potential, potentially, you know, it's certainly life-altering decision for, at the age of 14 because they're uncomfortable in their body. That that just seems crazy to do, and it is crazy. They, I, this was one of the ones that uh, jumped out to me. Dr. Daniel Metzger, who's a Canadian endocrino- endocrinologist, uh, wrote in one of these uh, forums, right, these internal forums at WPATH, uh, it's always a good theory that you talk about fertility pr- preservation with a 14-year-old, but I know I'm talking to a blank wall. They'd be like, ooh, ba- kids, babies, gross. So here's the, they're basically acknowledging that you can't have a conversation with a 14-year-old about the loss of their fertility because they have no concept about wanting to have kids. At 14 years old, having a kid sounds terrifying. Um, or just completely off the off the, the uh, table for you. So yeah, why would you care if uh, if you're going to lose your fertility? But I'll tell you what: at 21, 23, 30, 35, 
you're going to really be caring about that kind of thing. Yeah, the, the thing that's really scary about this, and, and it's always exciting when, when we hear another whistleblower account that, okay, we are in a tipping point moment. But the reality of this is, is that just yesterday I had a parent um, of a kid who's struggling in this area commit suicide. The child committed suicide at the age of 20. Um, and, uh, and, and this was a child that was in the process of detransitioning. Like it already realized that this course that I've been on, um, that really the doctors, the children's hospitals had put them on uh, for years did not work. And they're further away and, you know, from, from health than when they first started. Um, that is the reality of what's going on. And, and, and really how many of those instances are going to have to occur yeah. in this country before um, we realize we can start, you know, turning, reversing course on this. We do have, thankfully, 11 public cases, I believe, and, and then six private cases um, where, um, you know, folks are basically, there's lawsuits all across the country uh, against these hospitals as well as pharmaceutical companies that um, that are harming children. And that's that's all good news. Well, and, and Dave, I think one of the things that you just touched on there about, you know, we, we I remember we prayed about that, about this uh, th- this person that just co- t- took their life uh, last week. Um, one of the things, though, that that's that's so damaging about this uh, these transgender procedures that are being done is that these are kids, right, that are experiencing great distress, right? And actually, I, I can't recommend enough. I'm going to recommend another podcast. Go go listen to Barry Weiss and Abigail Schreier's podcast. Uh, honestly. Um, about Abigail's new book, uh, Bad Therapy, um, it, and it, it it actually unpacks a lot of what's going on with the mental health crisis in America and how really the, it, the and this is a great example of it. Our treatment method is actually perpetuating yeah. the mental health crisis that we have. But in in these cases, especially when you bring the transgender medicine conversation into this, actually, what what you have is instead of kids getting the help they need. They're putting, being put on a track to make the very problem worse. Yeah. Um, and so when I think about that, uh, and again, I, I can't remember if it was a boy or girl who took their life, uh, but the, the, the young person you told us uh, committed suicide. Like, yeah, they'd gone down this path for so long. And, and it wasn't just that they had gone down this path, but they weren't getting the help they needed in that time. Right. right? And, and that's what's so, so deadly. And, and it, it's why I take such great offense. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't want to keep beating this dead horse, but when when the governor stood up and talked about how he was doing he was vetoing the bill because he was pro-life, um, it, it's it's so obviously a dangerous statement that he made and so obviously an untruth that again, you don't need to be a a doctor to be able to look at this stuff and say, this is, you know, you had one person talking about how they did uh, more than 20 vaginoplasties. Uh, and, you know, because we might have young ears listening, I'm not going to explain what that is, but you can imagine uh, what that is on uh, children under the age of 18, right? I mean, that's, that is forever medicalizing uh, that, that, that young man uh, to do something that's completely impossible. He is not a girl now, and he does not have uh, girl parts now that you've done that. He has just had his male parts mutilated. Um, so, so I, I will say this is one of those stories that we are going to to tr- continue to track and 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 share with you on. We're probably going to un- uh, try to unpack this a little bit more because uh, there's so much on it. I will. Uh, the, the Daily Signal, uh, our friend Tyler O'Neill over there wrote a great story that I, I can't recommend to you enough. Um, but uh, just a couple quick uh, plugs for you here before we jump into uh, the the conversation with Brad Wilcox. Uh, first and foremost, don't forget. We have an election coming up. I know uh, uh, today as we're recording it, uh, Nikki Haley just uh, dropped out uh, of the presidential election, but that does not mean the election is off here in Ohio. Uh, we have uh, a, a very important election on March 19th. Uh, you can go vote in person um, right now, uh, or you can go uh, vote on election day on March 19th. And it's not just the presidential election. We have the Senate. We have congressional races. We have state house and state senate races that are up for their primary elections. Uh, And I will tell you, so many races are decided in the primary. Uh, So make sure uh, you get out to vote. Make sure, honestly, make sure you're talking to your friends about going to vote because this is going to be a a very low turnout election. uh, And and you making sure you get out to vote, you get your church out to vote uh, is going to be key. Um, the other thing that uh, Mike has asked me to make sure we plug is that we have our upcoming Ask Us Anything episode in two weeks, two weeks from now. 
Uh, so you guys can tell Mike that I've done my job and I've made the plug. You can leave a voicemail or a text at 614. Keep your comments to yourself, David. 769. Please keep them to yourself, David. 7077. Job, uh, sorry. <laughs> voicemail or text. 614-769-7077, or just shoot us an email at the narrative at ccv.org, uh, or just call David Mahan and his cell phone no, number. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, we always love doing the uh, the Ask Us Anything episode, so if you've got uh, questions, you can shoot us an email at the narrative at ccv.org, or just literally there's a million different ways to get a hold of us. You can get a hold of us, uh, but uh, but grateful for you. And also, by the way, if you haven't yet, make sure you leave a, a review or a like uh, on the podcast. Uh, I know uh, you can maybe even rate David's performance. I know it's been slipping this season. He'll, he'll step it up in the second half here. No, but uh, we'll, uh, we're going to take a quick break here, and when we come back, we'll be here with Brad Wilcox. Hey, Narrative listeners. You know, Christians in the marketplace today face more unique and challenging threats than ever before. Businesses are following woke capitalism, chambers of commerce are beholden to social justice, and secular activists are chipping away Christians' First Amendment rights. As Ohio's only Christian Chamber of Commerce, the Christian Business Partnership stands in the gap to advocate for, to educate, and to celebrate Christian business owners. Joining the partnership also allows businesses to provide their employees with health care insurance, workers' compensation, and exclusive banking and educational discounts. To find out more and to join, go to cbpohio.org. That's cbpohio.org. We're back on the narrative. Mike Andrews, Aaron Baird, David Mahan, and we're joined now by Brad Wilcox. And Brad is a professor of sociology and the director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia. He's a future Freedom Fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He's the author of a new book, Get Married, Why Americans Should Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. Wilcox studies marriage, fatherhood, and the impact of strong and stable families on men, women, and children. Professor Wilcox is the author and co-author of six books and has written for scientific journals such as the American Sociological Review and the Journal of Marriage and Family, as well as popular outlets like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, and National Review. Brad, it is so great to have you here on The Narrative today. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on, guys. So let's talk about your new book. It's it's a pretty simple title, at least, uh, Get Married, Why It's Good for, for People to Get Married and Stay Married. Can you just give us the elevator pitch for, for what the book is and and why, um, why this research is just kind of so obvious but so necessary in this cultural moment that we're in? Yeah, well, we're facing kind of a huge paradox. And the paradox is that on the one hand, we're seeing marriage rates come down. And on the other hand, we're seeing so much evidence indicating that marriage matters for kids and adults. There's no group of Americans who are no group of Americans who are less lonely, who are reporting more meaningful lives, or who are happier than married Americans. So that's the story that the book is sort of wrestling with. The paradox the book is wrestling with. And, um, you know, it's it's important because really nothing predicts uh, a happy life today in America like a good marriage. So, Brad, the, the thing that jumped out to me this time looking at your your book title is Defy the Elites. What what do you mean by that and why why did you put that in the, the, the subject or the, the subtitle? Yeah, well, when I initially kind of indicated the book was launching on Twitter, I got some pushback from prominent journalists about that. And I said, well, the elites actually are succeeding when it comes to getting and staying married. So why are you, you know, dunking on the elites was kind of the response on Twitter. And of course, the you know, poor the point... elites, Brad, take it easy on the elites. <laughs> Haven't they suffered enough? Uh, sorry. <laughs> the, the point is that, you know, obviously, in fact, the book makes the point that, yes, college educated Americans are more likely to be marrying today and stably married as well. So the elites are doing actually OK when it comes to marriage and family. But they're giving the broader public messages that are not marriage friendly. And I chronicle any number of messages in the book and you know, stories and movies and films and songs that aren't particularly marriage friendly in the book as well, that kind of just give you some sense, though, of what I'm talking about when it comes to, you know, this idea that the elites aren't particularly, you know, friendly um, to marriage. 
when I was finishing up the book, <clears throat> I came across this headline trending on Twitter. And it was that, quote, women who stay single and don't have kids are getting richer from Bloomberg, the financial news service, no less. And the article was kind of suggesting that women should steer clear of marriage if they want to be, <clears throat> you know, in a good spot financially. So that's that's one example. A second example, New York Times, Amy Sherman, a writer, she says, quote, married heterosexual motherhood in America is a game no one wins. Okay, so kind of suggesting in, in her piece that, you know, motherhood, marriage, or path to basically misery. And the unfortunate reality is that this kind of thinking that's broadcast by elites, I think helps to explain why today in part we're seeing a majority of women, according to a new study from my colleagues at the American Enterprise Institute survey, think that marriage is not a good deal for women, whether it's not a good deal for women, and it's particularly true for younger women. So this idea has kind of disseminated across the entire culture. And yet what we see is that, again, there's no group of women who are happier than actually married moms in that kind of prime of life, you know, in the mid 30s, 40s and 50s. So the the messaging around marriage and motherhood, for instance, you know, from the left is terrible. Of course, you probably have some thoughts too about the the new messages on the online right as well for men. Yeah, I mean, if 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 they're benefiting so well from marriage privilege, I guess you could call it right, because I love what you what you say about um, the left talks uh, or the elites talk left but walk right. Right. And, and my question, you know, reading your your research uh, along with Ian is why, you know, if if they understand because of their benefit from it, why are they so hard pressed to to say, hey, you know, even to the extent that it's racist to say that um, that, that that children benefit uh, from certain types of uh, family structures than others? Yeah, so I think the reason that, that elites uh, say this is, you know, a couple of fold. Number one is there's kind of a longstanding concern that any discussion of marriage and family, you know, touches on <clears throat> racial, you know, differences. Um, this goes back to the Moynihan report and and the response to the Moynihan report. So there's kind of a desire not to kind of, you know, basically address any issues that might touch on um, racial differences in America. I think the second thing, though, that's playing out here in part is that there is particularly for elites, like a real, you know, American focus on choice and giving people freedom to do what they want, how they want it, you know, when they want. And I think elites especially are used to kind of making their own choices when it comes to school, when it comes to university, when it comes to, you know, vacation spots, homes, the whole nine yards. And so they think that ethic of choice should extend to the our most profound, you know, family relationships. And the final piece is that, <clears throat> There's kind of a temptation, I think, to baptize every new thing that comes down the road when it comes to relationships and family and sort of say, this is the newest thing and we're progressive, you know, forward thinking and we're going to accept this newest thing. What was when divorce, you know, no fault divorce back in the 70s to now even polyamory in, in, in some precincts as well. So. This is just kind of par for the course, I think, for elites in terms of just wanting to signal that they're progressive and correct thinkers. Brad, I, I want to kind of drill in with you here. Uh, and this is something we're talking a, a lot about at CCV right now. When you we, we look in Ohio and we see, you know, 43 percent of kids are born outside of wedlock. Um, you know, you really, uh, you know, I, I first came across your work years ago with the success sequence um, and, you know, the, the idea of graduate high school, uh, get a job, don't have kids till you get married uh, to, to avoid poverty. Um, but, but that, that, that baseline idea of uh, out of wedlock births, kids being born without their, their married mom and dad, what, what is the uh, impact of that on a child? What what is what does the data show overall? And again, this is one of those hard things to say. There's obviously single parents that uh, buck the trends and and do great, but we're talking about overall. What what does the data show us about the impact it has on a child to be born without uh, a married mom and dad in the home? So it's important to say just two things on on that question, particular one is that I was raised by a single mom, and obviously, as you were just saying, you know, many kids <clears throat> turn out just fine. You know, raised in in 
a variety of different family contexts. Um, and it's also important to note too, that most kids born outside of wedlock today are born to cohabiting, you know, parents. Although the problem with that particular scenario is that most of those cohabiting couples, you know, don't stay together. So they end up becoming single um, parent families, for, you know, for those children. But the, the bigger point here is that kids being raised in any kind of non-intact family are more likely to be struggling, you know, on average, even though many do just fine. And what we see, for instance, is that when it comes to college graduation, they're about twice as likely um, if they're raised by their own, you know, intact, uh, typically married parents to graduate from college compared to kids raised in some kind of home without, you know, both their, uh, their parents. And when it comes to things like sadness and depression, um, kids, especially girls, are more likely to report that they're, you know, sad or depressed if they're raised apart from their intact family. And the most striking thing, though, for me is that in looking at all this data with my colleague, Dr. Wendy Wing at the Institute for Family Studies, what we found was that boys who were raised outside of an intact family were more likely, more likely to land in prison or in jail than they were to graduate from college. I mean, just wow. kind of, that was the most surprising thing for me, looking at the stats for the kids in our research for this new book, Get Married. And, you know, Brad, just thinking about some of the less narratives on this, how does this adjust for race? How does it adjust for for, for those types of issues? Again, you, you, you look at uh, so much of what's happening in culture today, and the, the primary conversation is a lot of times driven by the media based around, around race. Um, what, what does the data say there? So one thing to say is those, I can tell you, for instance, that, you know, young men are about twice as likely to land in prison or in jail um, if they're being raised outside of an intact family. And that's controlling for race and parental education and any number of other factors that might confound that relationship. But it's also important to just underline this fact, and that is that single, you know, white young men from single parent families are more likely to land in jail than black young, young men who are coming from you know, intact families with both their parents. So yes, race is an important factor in American life. We all know that. But it's worth also underlining that on some outcomes and some issues, family structure matters more than race. Um, and, and beyond this particular question, for instance, what we see is that the best predictor of mobility for poor kids at the neighborhood or the community level is the share of two-parent families, not race. Okay, And this is from Raj Chetty's work at Harvard. So on a lot of outcomes, a lot of issues, we see that, you know, having um, two parents in the household, preferably your own bio parents, you know, or your married parents is very valuable for uh, for kids. So, hang on, I, I want to go back to something you just said there, Brad. So did you just, to understand what you were saying, were you referring to not just that parent, that kid being raised with their two parents, but if the families around them and their community are also in that structure, is, is that what I heard you saying as well, that the, the neighborhood, the community. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's that's an interesting uh, part of this as well. Yeah, I think a lot of us, we're kind of tempted to think about our relationships in terms of maybe ourselves, maybe our spouse, you know, or our boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, maybe our kids, right? But we don't necessarily have the recognition that um, what we have, sort of what we're doing in our own home doesn't just matter for us, it matters for our entire neighborhood and our entire community and then even our country, right? So um, what we see from the work of Raj Chetty at Harvard and his colleagues looking at patterns of mobility in communities across America, the communities with more two-parent families, like in the Salt Lake City metro area, have a lot more mobility. That is, poor kids are more likely to rise as adults into you know, affluence, for instance. By contrast, poor kids um, being raised in um, you know, Atlanta, Georgia is one of their comparison cities, are more likely to be stuck in poverty as they move into adulthood. And one of the big issues there for, you know, for that story is that, you know, Atlanta has many more single parent families um, as a share of population than does Salt Lake City. And so poor kids, even poor kids in single parent families do better when they are surrounded by two parent families growing up. And the other piece I would mention just quickly on this one is that we've seen happiness in America come down in the country come down um, in the last, you know, 25 years, give or take. 
And what the data suggests to us is the number one factor kind of accounting for this decline in happiness in America is that fewer Americans are getting married. So this retreat from marriage we're talking about today doesn't just matter again for individuals. It matters kind of for the collective mood of the country as well. Yeah, I've been following the work um, that you all have been doing around the sex success sequence for years. Um, and, and we understand that, you know, um, 97 percent of kids, that if they go through all these these steps, you know, graduate high school, um, work a full time job, have children inside of marriage. If they follow this process, 97 percent of them will avoid poverty. Right. And we understand that they do better in terms of incarceration and things like that. But but the question for those that may be listening who this is new to, um, why? Like, what are some of the benefits uh, that that kids with two parent intact homes, um, you know, what, what are some of the benefits for those children that lead to these really healthy outcomes? So um, what I would say is that it's still the case, you know, that there are kind of three pillars to the American dream. One is education, one is full-time work, and one is marriage. And you know, making the claims about education work is not controversial and, you know, in academia or in public life. So I'm not going to, you know, belabor those two points. Uh, when it comes to marriage, though, that is controversial. And like, what is it about marriage per se that's valuable for adults, young adults today? Right. And I would say a couple of things. One is that we know that men tend to work harder and smarter and more successfully when they get married. We know that men who are single are more likely to quit a job, for instance, without lining up a new job. Married men don't do that. They get the second job before they quit the first job if they're having some challenge at work. They're less likely to be fired, married men are, compared to the roughly equivalent single peers. We know from twin studies that married men make more money. One twin study found 26% more money as married guys compared to their identical twin brother. So the evidence is pretty darn strong um, about marriage and men working harder. And then when you talk about men and women together, they're pooling money oftentimes, they're more prudent in their savings and investments. And then as they hit midlife in their 50s, both married men and women, about 10 times the assets compared to their never married peers. So that's a lot of money, basically. And one other key point to make here is that a lot of my critics would say when it comes to sort of success in America, marriage doesn't matter. It's about work and education. Those are the things that matter. But they don't appreciate all the points that I've just made. And they also don't appreciate this next point. And that is that family instability is super expensive. Okay, so if you're a single parent, usually a single mother, you're not getting that income from the dad, you know, pulling into the household. That's a huge issue. Both parents are going to be, you know, paying for two dwellings rather than just one dwelling. That's super extra expensive. Other expenses, obviously, that they're not pooling together in terms of like a shared television or a shared refrigerator or whatever. Um, and then for the non-resident parent, usually a non-residential -res father, he's going to have to pay child support. I talked to one guy, you know, in my uh, book research who had a couple of kids with different women and like 40 percent of his, I think, paycheck uh, was going out the door every time it came in the door to um, one of those, um, you know, other parents. Um, so, I mean, all know that divorce is expensive too, in terms of just legal costs, attorney's fees, you know, it's just kind of a nightmare. So the point I'm making simply is that getting married and staying married um, is hugely rewarding for ordinary Americans when it comes to their financial picture. And it's unfortunate we haven't done a very good job of communicating this to the broader public. You know, it's interesting. I was in a, in a school, you know, because you, know, you mentioned that the marriage rates are going down. And which always strikes me and, and a generation of, you know, millennials and even, the, you know, the Z's that um, are getting married later and later. Um, and then the research is, that, well, these kids today are just crazy. I just, and I always make the, the argument of somebody that's been in schools all across the country for years. I've never been in a group, uh, regardless of inner city, rural or suburban, where I said, how many want to have a great marriage and family one day where the majority of the kids did not raise their hand? Last week, uh, Brad, I was in a in a very poor school here um, in, in downtown Columbus, and uh, there was 10 young men in eighth grade. And I said, how many want to have a great marriage and family one day? Every hand went up. And I said, how many come from a home where mom and dad was in there every day, you know, taking care of business? 
and not one hand went up. And, but yet they all want to have a great marriage and family one day. So how do you, you know, we, we've had a lot of discussion around the office uh, here in the policy department uh, in, in the education department around why that is, right? It seems like at, at a certain age, everybody still has this innate desire to to be married and, and have a family. But yet at something, at some point, there's a switch that goes off and, and, and the marriage rate is declining. What, what is going on? Great question. I think um, part of the challenge is that young adults are not getting very good advice or good modeling about how to date. And what we know is that people who are kind of dating with an eye towards marriage, uh, people who are kind of moving slowly, both physically and emotionally into a relationship, people who are looking for a partner of high character, not just someone who's funny or charming or pretty or rich or, you know, with promising prospects, you know, financially, um, more likely to flourish. So I think, you know, if we could do a better job of helping people understand how to date well, um, there's a book, I think it's called How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk. It's in that basic spirit, but a lot of good practical advice about how to, you know, date successfully would be uh, would be helpful for our young adults, for our teens. Um, they're just getting tons of messages too on TikTok and Insta, you know, that are kind of encouraging a short-term mindset when it comes to dating and sex and relationships that is obviously counterproductive. And so what that means then, right, is that by the time they hit, you know, 25 or 30, whatever it might be, maybe even 21, they've seen and experienced things about dating and relationships and the opposite sex that, you know, are really big turnoffs and have kind of led them to become more cynical about the possibility of lifelong love and a good marriage. And of course, they may have seen lots of drama, in, you know, in their parents' lives or in their in, in their friends' lives that also make them a bit hesitant about the um, the value of marriage today. So I'm going to put on my uh, pink critical gender theorist hat here, Brad, um, and, you know, push back on you and say, well, everything that you just said is based off of sort of oppressive patriarchal uh, ideology, right? Mm -hmm. sure. um, and and the, the reality is, uh, you know, this is, people are less happy because the system is built to incentivize a patriarchal union and and, and again, we, we can kind of laugh at, at this kind of stuff and make jokes about it as I just did, but Sure. No, it's, well, not, what, it's, a, it's real. It's real, right? It, it's it's what is driving a lot of, uh, you know, it, academia. It's what's so unique about you being at University of Virginia doing this this work. Is there any, what would your greatest critics come back with you on? Is there data to support what they're saying? Is there, how would you, well, what are yeah, you getting so let, pushed let back answer, on? So I think one, but one important thing we got to get, get out there really quickly again is that what, there's so many like negative claims about marriage and motherhood, for instance, out there. I'm just like, Folks, just get on the general social survey, the GSS, anyone. I mean, you, anyone listening can just jump on their computer, go to the site and start and analyzing the data. They've got a platform that helps you analyze data and just do a cross tab with happiness and marriage women. If you're more sophisticated, you can look at marriage, motherhood, and women um, and happiness. And what you will see is that the happiest um, women today in America, ages 18 to 35, are married moms. So what we see particularly is that 40% of married moms are very happy in the GSS in 2022, um, compared to uh, just 16% um, of single moms and 22% of single and childless women. Okay, huge, huge divide. Who's the unhappiest group in this in this you know data set? It's unmarried women without children. Um, that 25 of them percent of them are not too happy in this data set. And that compares to just 13% of married moms in the data set. So just the data tell us that married moms are happier uh, than any other group of women. Now, of course, being a mom is super hard. We all know that. It's not, not rocket science, not, not breaking news. But it brings a tremendous amount of meaning and joy and less loneliness for, for women. Same thing for married dads, obviously, as well. So that's the empirical story. But the, uh, and, and we're getting that message out, I think, pretty successful. Even The Atlantic had a piece kind of acknowledging that, yeah, married people are happier. And so then the <laughs> rejoinder is, right, that it's all about selection effects. You know, it's also I got this from Matt Brunig, who's a progressive ad, you know, um, advocate on the left and from Pearl Davis is online, right? You know, anti-feminist, uh, big, big player online. 
you know, she she hates marriage from the right, so to speak, thinks it's bad for men. So both of them, both Pearl Davis on the right and Matt Brunig on the left are basically saying, well, the reason that Wilcox comes up with these kinds of statistics is that marriage is super selective for like rich, successful, happy guys. And yeah, well, no surprise that when they get married, they're richer and happier because they already were richer and happier and they were therefore attractive on the dating market, you know, in the marriage market. So, and there's certainly truth to this idea that part of what's happening here is that the kinds of people today get married are more educated, more well-off, more religious. That's not, not as known. Um, and probably more socially adept, you know, um, and probably happier as well. But we also have good evidence too from, um, you know, from economists um, studying this, this sort of question with um, different kinds of data set that sorry data sets that tell us that even kind of controlling for pre-existing um, happiness that people who get married are more likely to um, to be flourishing across life course, particularly in um, in middle age. I'm quoting here from the economist Sean Grover and John Halliwell. They say that they find quote a causal effect at all stages of the marriage from prenuptial bliss to marriages of long duration. So again, what I'm saying is that the kinds of norms and customs and values that we kind of connect to marriage, um, while not like some kind of magic potion, are helpful to many of us who, who get married and enjoy the financial stability and generally speaking, most of the time, happiness that follows from putting a ring on it. Yeah, and, and Brad, it sounds too like some of this, the happiness factor aside, when you consider that marriage has been so foundational to all of human history to, to get us where we are today by by men and women getting together and having kids, but you consider that part of that is just what what is the thing grading against our current uh, culture of self autonomy, and that you got to think about somebody else when you're married. You have to think about your wife, and ultimately that leads to you thinking about kids. And to your point about the communities benefiting, it gets you outside of yourself, and that's just something that our that our culture is not very good at right now. It seems like. Yeah, I, I do think part of the challenge here is kind of a short-term, long-term thing. You know, and I think it is the, it is true that being a spouse and especially a parent requires a lot of sacrifices. You know, Saturday mornings are much uh, busier. You're not sleeping in, you know. Um, when you've got babies, you're waking up early, you're waking up at night, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, when you've got a teenager, there's obviously drama that can come from teen, you know, teens being sullen or whatever it might be, right? So I, I'm not saying that being a parent is a cakewalk is not. But it's like, you think about, you know, Churchill and his line about democracy. <laughs> you know, democracy is the worst form of government <clears throat> until you think about all the other options, right? So being a parent, <laughs> you know, there are many mornings and, you know, evenings when you're a parent, you're just like, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening or I can't believe, you know, got to do this or, you know, wow, this diaper, you know, just whatever. And you can spend, <laughs> you know, fill in the blanks, right? You know, like compared to what? Like, would you rather just be sitting on a, you know, on a, a game box for like, you know, all eternity? Would you like to be just yes. watching Netflix movies on, you know, eternal return? Um, you know, do you want to just be, um, you know, basically living in a life where no one really cares about you and you don't care about anyone else and you're just kind of living for the moment. I mean, that's misery. We know like the people who live this way end up completely miserable on average, right? So by contrast, people who are living with and for others, their spouse, their kids, their friends, their communities, no question, more likely to be happy, flourishing, you know, meaningful lives. Yeah. So Brad, and I just, I just need to affirm what he said about teenagers in the house. Cause I got four of them and yeah. it, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge, but it's Mike also a joy. Crying. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's in a fetal position over here. Just you, you touched him. Um, we, we uh, met with you not too long ago, Brad, and you know that we're, we're not just ones to, to kind of curse the darkness. You know, how, how do we turn this shit? Um, you know, if, if it, it is kind of a bleak looking scenario here. Um, but just like I mentioned, those, those young people, who have not seen a lot of healthy marriage, there's still that seed of faith. There's still that seed of, of truth somewhere that, that they want something that they may not even know uh, how to get. Um, so how do we turn the ship related to, to marriage in America? So I think one um, piece of the response to your question is that we need to do a better job of uh, publicizing the benefits of marriage and kind of giving people 
a roadmap for how to forge uh, a, a good marriage kind of heading in in terms of dating, but also once once you put a ring on it. And I talk about five things in the book, communion, children, commitment, cash, and community. Just touch quickly on three of those things. When it comes to community, we know that like having regular date nights is super valuable for couples, keeps that spark alive. You know, so when the kids fly in the nest, you're not kind of just staring at each other, other over, you know, a, a warm dinner and wondering what you might say to each other, right? So that's communion. Commitment, couples who embrace both the importance of fidelity, you know, not looking at other options, both in person, nowadays online, right? Obviously important. And keep the D word out of their conversations. Divorce, obviously, you know, are more likely to have a kind of long-term orientation and more likely to be flourishing. And then um, <clears throat> cash is also super valuable in terms of just recognizing that, you know, hard work is important for families, particularly turns out for having, you know, a stable male breadwinner. That's, that's, and in terms of the happiness piece, women can either work outside the home or not, but what is linked to more happier families are situations where the husband is a reliable, you know, steady, decent breadwinner. And then actually one more seat is community. And I find in my book that couples who go to church together are um, markedly happier in their marriages, more sexually satisfied, have more sex. That was kind of the biggest surprise for adults in all the research. 65% of church-going couples have sex once a week or more, compared to less than half of secular couples or, or couples that go to church together. That was a huge surprise. And that's, I think, a newer development. I'm not sure what's driving it, but it's certainly fascinating. So those kinds of things can be touchstones for people, help them you know, get married. Something like a PSA in Ohio would be really helpful about the value of marriage. And then efforts to kind of, you know, teach people about dating and strong marriages as well. But then also on the policy front, getting rid of marriage penalties um, at the federal level would be super helpful. And I know that Senator Vance has talked about some ideas there um, to do that. And um, having a child tax credit that's marriage friendly would be another thing that would be great. Um, and then finally, I would talk to you about addressing the cost of housing in your more um, you know, metropolitan parts of the state, you know, and there are ideas about how to, how to reduce market costs and make single family houses more accessible to middle class and working class families. So those are some things that would help, I think, both at the federal and the state level. So Brad, I want to, and I think there's, you know, at CCB's perspective, there's a lot of things we want to tackle there. I want to, you, you said something a little bit earlier though, I want to circle back to, um, and, the, the the flip side of this uh, sort of single parent uh, phenomenon or, or ch child being raised outside of wedlock um, and even more so than that, uh, men not being married and, uh, you know, being on their Xbox and watching Netflix all day and that kind of stuff is is what happens at the tail end of this is what happens with the elderly. Right. Um, and and I, I think about I mean, even just what we've gone through with you know some of you know my my wife's grandparents what we're going through with now with, with we're getting into that phase with some of our parents um of of caring for your parents and caring for folks when they're elderly what what's the demographic sort of data say to us about where america's heading on on that side when you don't have family there to take care of you uh, in that that later stage in life is that anything that you've looked at with with your work I touch on this in a chapter called The Closing of the American Heart in the new book um, that I've just written and just kind of gesture towards what we're seeing happen in Japan. And it's just a lot of, you know, sobering stories kind of emerging from Japan where we're learning about, you know, companies in Japan specializing, and this is pretty brutal, in cleaning out human remains that have been kind of not discovered for a week or two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is because in Japan, there are so many adults who don't have, you know, spouse or children, adult children kind of to be there for them or with them. And that pattern is spreading across East Asia. And now in some ways is spreading across the Pacific to the United States. One of the figures in the book that I think is sobering is that we're seeing now in America for adults who are aged 18 to 55, there are more of them who are kinless, no spouse, no kids than who have um, gotten married and have children. And that's a very new development that we're seeing. It's part of what we call kind of a kinless America. 
a number, you know, large minority of folks, you know, in the next 20, 30, 40 years, as they move into midlife and later life, it's going to be, I think, pretty hard for a lot of them. Well, Brad, as we wrap up here, I'm, I'm just curious, how did you get into this, this line of study and, and focusing so much on, on marriage and families? So I was raised, as I mentioned, by a single mom and kind of had this insight in college at the University of Virginia that like dads were kind of important. And, you know, marriage was that institution that connected oftentimes men to their children. Um, so that kind of led me to study uh, marriage and family at Princeton and, and get my PhD. So I had a long running kind of concern about the, the role of marriage in kids' lives. But as I've been talking more recently to adults and to my students at UV, in particular, especially the women, there's just a lot of fear about their future when it comes to love and marriage. They are concerned they're not going to find a good partner who is worthy of commitment, interested in commitment, has their act together. You know, particularly the younger women I talked to at UVA have this fear. And they're worried they're not going to get married. Um, and I think that these concerns are merited. They're legitimate because dating is hard today. The social media and phones don't help, obviously, in the main. Um, and a lot of our young men are having difficulty flourishing. And we're seeing ideological polarization, too, where young women are moving left, young men are moving a little bit to the right, makes it harder, too. So there's just a lot of factors playing out. And so this book is written in part to encourage young adults to be more intentional about taking steps to maximize their likelihood of meeting someone who could be a good spouse. And then also it's designed to encourage, you know, married moms and dads uh, like you guys um, with some practical ideas about how they can forge uh, good marriages uh, in a culture that's not particularly conducive to a strong and stable family. That, that's I'll just say it's funny. You bring up the, um, the social media side and the phone side of it. I was, I saw this video on on Twitter a few weeks back, and it was a uh, yeah some some video of a uh, it would look like a, a a concert or something an outdoor concert in the early two thousands, and they said and it was a bunch of college age students at this concert, and they said, look, nobody's on their phone. They're all they're talking to each other. Like people are looking at each other. Yeah, you know, they're hanging out, listening to music, having drinks, whatever. But it was. It's so it looks so weird as opposed to today where everybody would just be sort of, you know, half the people would be staring down at their phones in that situation now. And it's just a different way of relating. Yeah, no, we just I mean, I think we have to also and this is relates to to just um, the, the technology policy angle. We have to kind of advance public policies, both at the state and federal levels that give parents the power to say no to social media yeah. apps for their children. Um, the age verify for kids and just, you know, help parents kind of keep this, uh, this issue um, at bay more than is currently the case. Yeah. We just passed that in oh, uh, Lieutenant Governor John Husted got that into the state budget. And of course the AC, I think it was the ACLU that sued to block yeah. it for some reason. And it's blocked in court right now, but um, the, the social media age verification. So, yeah. Well, Brad, we're we're really grateful for your time and for your work. If if people want to connect with you or follow what you're what you're up to, what are the best ways that they can find you online? So Bradwilcox.com, Brad Wilcox IFS on Twitter, and then familystudies.org are all places that they can kind of find the work. And the book is again get married and accessible on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Narrative, presented by CCV and produced by Wessler Media. If you found today's episode insightful, leave us a review or rating and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. We're your hosts, Mike Andrews, Aaron Bear, and David Mahan, and we'll see you next time on The Narrative.